Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with David Fried at LAM Research. We're going to talk today about design technology co-optimization. David, we're hearing a lot about DTCO. Is that the new DFM, Design for Manufacturing, or is it something different? Um, it's a great question. It is a hot new topic. Um, maybe it's the new DFM. Uh, but DTCO is really critical to, to the industry now, but also to future scaling. Um, and frankly, it's one of the very few acronyms in the industry that means exactly what it says. It's the co-optimization of design and chip technology. So let's dig into this. What exactly is it? Um, let's take a look on the board. So really DTCO, as I said, it, it, it's the coming together of two worlds. And the two worlds we're talking about is really the design world and chip technology Now, each of these communities in the semiconductor industry has two main responsibilities. Uh, the chip designers, they really have to produce the, the design of the chip and in the end, the layout, right? The physical design that's going to become masks. The technology team, the technology community, they have to put together a process flow. How that chip is going to be fabricated in the fab. Those are the things that have to be produced by the two groups, but obviously they're, they're very heavily interconnected. The layout's going to become masks, that's going to become parts of the flow. The flow is going to produce the devices and the structures that are going to be the chip in the layout. So these two things are very, very heavily related. How do they go together? The design community has requirements, okay? Those requirements are like density, shapes, different shapes that they need to be able to design, different patterns, different density to try to make their chip uh, have a market value. And the way the technology responds to that is by producing rules. They need to make sure that what you design is going to yield here, rules or checks. Now these become even more interrelated, right? Once you understand the process flow, you can produce rules. Those rules go to the design community, and they make the layout. The layout then gets transmitted to the fab, goes into the fab to be processed, and then you have a chip, and that chip has to meet the requirements. So you have this sort of back and forth and iterative um, connection between the key deliverables and requirements of these two communities. If you're figuring this out on the fly, how these relate as you go through a chip development program, it can be very, very slow, and it can lead to some really serious surprises late in a process. Is the choreography of these different uh, areas become more difficult as you get into, say, seven nanometers and five nanometers going down the, the process nodes, and also into some of the uh, uh, advanced packages where you have lots of different elements there, accelerators and different kinds of memories? Absolutely. So. Scaling and the complexity of technologies has made this much, much more complicated. Uh, it's made it complicated for a couple different reasons. First of all, the process flow has gotten very, very challenging. The number of different layout constructs or design constructs has gotten even higher. Different types of memories, different types of customized cells and standard cells. So all of that has driven this to be a really, really complicated choreography, as you say. And again, if you're doing it during the program, you're in a lot of trouble. And so what DTCO aims to do is it aims to figure out a lot of this choreography, a lot of this interplay much earlier in the program. It aims to make sure that these rules and checks accurately reflect the process flow that's going to go into manufacturing and that they satisfy these requirements of the design community. And there's often some triage some push and pull, some compromise between these rules and these requirements and layout in order to make this work. The earlier you do it, the fewer surprises you have later, the higher your yield is going to be earlier. If you slice this down, you have a lot of elements that are basically moving pieces here. So you've got software development, which is happening all the way through from the earliest stage because you've already got something there that will actually work. Um, you don't have actually a working silicon, but you have a working design. You have other sides where you have to say, okay, how are we going to verify this? That has to move further left. How do all these things stack up? Because you've got multiple pieces moving here and lots of data moving around. Yeah, so there's a couple pieces to that puzzle, to be honest. Um, if 
At day one of a chip program, you knew exactly what the process flow was and you knew exactly what the design was, this would be pretty easy. Uh, but you don't. These things evolve over time as you, as you fight yield battles and you drive performance uh, improvements. And so everything has to move further or move earlier in the schedule if you're going to have any chance of, of making these more complex technologies yield. Uh, one of the things that becomes really interesting is you can have the most advanced process in the world, but unless you have an automated way for, uh, to implement it and to check it in the fab, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing on the design community. I can have the best rules and the best design systems, but unless I've developed the automated EDA infrastructure to implement those, it doesn't matter. It won't be deployed because these chip designs are getting so large and so complex with so many different structures and so many different shapes that without automation, of these rules without automation of this DTCO, this back and forth and compromise, none of this really matters. So this isn't just about talking to each other, it's about automating the interface between these two worlds. There's another element here as well, which is that for years the foundries have been adding margin into the design process so that they can basically make everything work. And it's been fairly substantial, but as you get into the more advanced nodes, now you have to knock that margin down because it's starting to interfere with performance and power, and you don't get the same kind of benefits as you got out of scaling in the past. Yeah, so these margins or guard bands that have been built in over the years, they have to be cut down uh, really for two reasons. One, as we shrink the nodes, as we shrink the dimensions, there's simply less room left. There's less uh, fat in the structure allowed uh, between yielding and not yielding. So the margins have to be reduced just because there's no room left. But also, anything you leave in the margins, anything you account for in variability, is taking away from the maximum performance you can achieve out of the product. And so, as some of the scaling constraints, dimensional scaling constraints, have slowed down a little bit, we've had to eat the margins to try to get the required performance in node-to-node -node scaling. Assuming you get all this right, and you're working with the latest tools on DTCO, how much time can you actually save out of the design process here? Um, okay, I, I think there's two ways to look at that. If you look at a large scale chip project from the first designs and the first evidence of, of technology in the fab, th this can be a multi-year process of going from an initial design to a full commercialization of a product. If you figure out these interactions and the interplay here early, that could easily save you a year or, or more in that flow. So DTCO has massive leverage and schedule, but there's sort of a, another way to look at this, which is there are plenty of products that have never made it to market because surprises emerged in this interplay late in the flow. And so, yes, you can save a significant amount of time and money in a, in a project like this, but you can also prevent the killer surprise late in a program. And so that's sort of like an infinite savings if something never made it to market. In the past, a lot of companies develop one chip and then they'd make derivative chips over and over again. The challenge now is that everything is becoming heavily customized. How does DTCO deal with this? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I think this, this old concept of one design and then just scaling it, shrinking it, scaling it, shrinking it, that I don't think is happening quite as much as it used to anymore, um, mostly because the technologies have become so different physically node to node, so it stopped this auto scaling trend, uh, but also the opportunities afforded by each new technology has led to much more customization in the design each time it goes to a new node. So I don't think this auto scaling trend uh, is, is occurring anymore. Um, the, the different memory types, different integration, different uh, diversity of technology offerings has really uh, created a, a dramatic amount of customization in the flow. Another thing that's changed is that in the past, you used to be able to say, we're going to design this block and we know how this is, block will work with another block. The challenge now is that these blocks are interrelated and what you're redoing and looking at may not be the just a block, it may be a couple blocks or it may be integrated systems here. Yeah, so, so actually if, if all the design was just sort of standard transistor layout, this DTCO dance wouldn't be too complicated. You could figure out what a few of the transistor layouts look like, you could test them, you could characterize them, you could iterate through this process, and you could develop a simple set of rules. Okay, that, that would be pretty simple, but that's 
simply not the way technologies are built. There's multiple different memory cells. There's multiple different logic constructs. There's many different device types. You can't possibly pre-characterize every single one of those. So you have to choose some set and then be able to extend your analysis across a full set of customization. In addition, uh, layouts can operate differently and behave differently even if they're the same layout placed in different environments on the chip. And so you have to be able to understand that, in the, understand the process flow effects, be able to codify that into rules and checks and, and issue that to the design community oftentimes without ever having tested or pre-characterized that in real silicon. So that, that's where the complexity here and that's where the automation really benefits the flow. So does this give you the ability to say, oh, this, we're going to try out different components here and whichever one works best over time, we're going to use that one and maybe we change it later on, does it still now fit into that flow? Absolutely, and I think you still do see that. And you see prototype parts you see early revision and later revisions of products where uh, ideas are tested, concepts are tested, different memory cells are tested for an optimization exercise prior to the final decisions going to product. If you think about the industry today, there is new technology being developed in places that we haven't seen it before. You think about um, in-memory compute, for example, that was on the drawing board a long time ago, but nobody ever actually did it. Now we're starting to see this stuff actually happening. Does DTCO take uh, advantage of that? Can you now pull all that in and say, here's something new that we never even dealt with before? Um, I think it gives you the framework to analyze that. So I think it is an advantage, but the way it has to happen is, um, take your example of in-memory compute. What in-memory compute would translate to is a different set of requirements from the chip where they're going to exercise uh, a circuit element or a memory element in a different way than had been exercised previously. So we would have different requirements. And we would have to understand how the process flow would interact with those requirements. And again, it comes back to, as long as you can kind of complete this loop and recognize that there's rules and checks to check on the, the uh, compliance to those rules that take into account those new requirements, you can get ahead of these relatively critical changes to technology like in-memory compute or, or plenty of others as long as you get through the same type of DTCO framework very early on in the flow. Another challenge has been if you think about a lot of the tools that are out there they've pretty much been integrated into other tools. Does DTCO work with other tools that are out there or do you now have to have your own flow for this? Oh no, I think DTCO is a, is a framework or a concept. There's a lot of different flows that go into this um, and a lot of different software tools and elements that need to be uh, interfacing and interacting in order to make this, as you said, choreography work well. Um, a lot of the design tools are relatively standardized EDA platforms, but there's still a lot of customization to those platforms at different customers and different uh, design communities. The technology side, there's um, a lot of different options for understanding process flow and simulating that and, and, and predicting process flow effects. And in the end, it has to end up in sort of rules and checks and design system enablement. And that enablement has to work with the EDA tools on the design side. So there's a lot of tools involved. This is more of a framework for how they all interact. Um, but the interfaces between these tools are critical to making it work. David Freed, thanks for a great explanation. Oh, thanks, Ed. I enjoyed this as usual.